and the support of the Surveyor General, uh, another handy contact. I just need to change. This uh, uh, is a, 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 the map that actually accompanied the application. You can see it's quite rudimentary, but he said, um, uh, this is where I'd like to go. Now, Ronald McPherson, McPherson was a very interesting character too, but it seems that he made money through activities in South Africa. He was an experienced organiser through his early mercantile marine and English naval training, and that was initiated through Lord Brassy, who also visited the society and talked to it in 1887. Brassy used two ships, the Hesperus and the Harbinger, for training with the Royal Navy, instructors operating through private agents Devon and Moore. McPherson then served in the Matabele land, Africa. Rebellion, the Boer War, was the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia, Colonial and State, South Australian Explorations, and J.C. Williamson's Opera Company. <laughs> he had divorce citations, he served in World War I, and he was involved in the early colonial plantations in the operation of New Guinea. So with the States under Treasurer, and the Society Treasurer advising the Premier, a scheme was hatched. This was a time when the province of South Australia was desperately looking for more mineral wealth, coal, gold, silver, and uh, uh, led to underpin the copper mines in southern South Australia. And the province, of course, was also seeking new pastoral lands and was keen to know of the impact of the dingo and the rabbits in these areas. So the Council of the Society and evidently the province's cabinet deemed the expedition had merit. So a contract was entered into. This is an example, and it's, it's hard to read, um, but uh, this is what um, the, the individuals took with them, a Gladstone bag, a trunk, a leather kit bag, three cases, a sack containing um, whatever, <laughs> and a drawing board. So that was the personal stuff. Uh, the expedition, as I said, was Bert Barclay, uh, McPherson, Langley, Miller, and the Aboriginal helpers. They were accompanied for a while by government geologist H. Y. L. Brown as far as Hergo Springs, now Alice, now Marie. And this is the route they took, approximately. So they set off uh, with a rail warrant, uh, the South Australian government gave them a rail warrant and access to camels. And the camels were actually quite expensive. These were all the government uh, uh, camels stored up at Mount Searle. And in today's terms, they're probably worth about eight or nine thousand dollars each. That's how expensive camels were for government use back in those days. Uh, and the uh, camels were the bull Billy, Cowles Eva, Kitty, both in your carving, and Baby and Rabbit. I think I've got that right. They departed Lee Creek on the 14th of May, passed through Farina, arriving at Maree. They then uh, contacted the state's under treasurer via the Overland Telegraph, asking that their contract be extended for two months. And Barclay was known as the skipper, and uh, they took the group up along the Mount Springs and uh, up there, what is now the Uda Data Track, from up there to Chuck Charlotte Waters, now Alice Springs. And uh, this is the uh, citation in the diary, and the diary is a little green book there with the white gloves on it. Uh, that um, they uh, gave uh, through the society and uh, to the government. Uh, Barclay said that they traversed the unmapped country, made a topical surveys of about um, two and a half thousand kilometres. They found a possible stop route from South Australia to Queensland and they found no trace of the Leichhardt party. That's actually the, uh, the party there. Uh, and I think that was taken outside of Government House um, with uh, McPherson, Langley and uh, Bert Barclay. So, 114 years later, what's happened? I, like most people, have not heard of Barclay, and uh, my ears pricked up because 
you know, once I become, uh, um, as I say, no longer car racing, I wanted other things to do, and uh, travelling in the deserts was, was of enormous interest, and if you could couple that with following old explorer tracks, it was even much more interesting. So um, I thought about um, um, uh, expo you know, understanding Barclay and, and getting on top of the whole lot of his uh, uh, trips and uh, so on, and that led me to the uh, Adelaide here where I uh, found the diary. It was, it was not lost; it was always in the in the, in the library, and uh, I read it uh, uh, for four or five days and met uh, Margaret here. I don't know if Margaret's here or not. She was very helpful. And uh, I might add other staff there were extremely helpful too because I was blowing off the street, you know, can I have a look at that diary? And uh, so that was uh, the start of um, doing my research on uh, how to find Barclay because it was intriguing that um, Dick Kimber from uh, Alice Springs, he's a 75 year old guy, just a young guy, and uh, he knows what's going on and he couldn't find it. And, uh, I went up and saw Suzette uh, to have a look and ask, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, why couldn't you find it? Could you show me where you went? And uh, uh, and, they, and Suzette ha happily showed me their tracks out on the Aussie Explorer, and uh, it was in the same trip that I had the diary. And I went home then and uh, started um, reading the diary properly, and I had my own maps out on the table and. Uh, I was saying to myself from a very early point that I, I don't reckon uh, what he's written in his diary is accurate, and, uh, uh, which is a bit of a big call to make when you're questioning someone's handwritten diary, and because uh, he had written in that diary there the latitude and longitude of where he left, left this over 250 kilos worth of goods. So um, it just didn't make sense that um, how I worked out where I should start walking is I knew where he started and eight months later where he finished. He, he finished at a place called, uh, we wanted to go to Anacora Moor on the way up and he wanted to go to Anacora Moor on the way back, which is not that far from Dalhousie um, uh, Springs up there. And uh, you can see Dalhousie, uh, pardon me, you can see Anacora Moor from Google Earth and he wrote the latitude and longitude there. He said to the government before he went he would uh, um, identify the location of that bore exactly because it was only put down a year or so earlier and, and whoever put the bore down maybe forgot the right where they put it. So, <laughs> so, so he had a fix on that and I found his fix and I found his error. He was about 2.1 kilometres out of where it should have been. But then he travelled north and every now and again I could read from the diary where he was getting to, especially on these latitude lines. He was recording them every day so I could I, I filled in every day the latitude where he was and uh, he went across to the Queensland border almost uh, and then he turned back again and I, you know, I kept tracking this in. He had good landmarks, he crossed the Hay River, or went as far as the Hay River, came back to the uh, Plenty and then the Illawagra and down to the Hale and bits of the Todd. So all these were identifiable without uh, uh, the longitude, which he was not writing down. He, I think he only made three references to longitude. But because longitude, as you all know, is, uh, may know, is to do with your timepiece, and that's the big variable, and, and that could be out a long way. So I'm plotting all this, and meanwhile I put his longitude and, and latitude on the map, my map, and it was massively out. And So then I, I backtracked from when he arrived back in Noonadatta, backtracked and got to the uh, uh, ar arena waterhole, which he didn't go to Ancora War and end, he went, went, come from Mount Peebles. And he only walked three days from uh, where he left the gear to where he could see Mount Peebles. And uh, he said he crossed 250 sand hills. And I could count them on uh, Google Earth. I drew a line from there uh, and counted out. And that added up to, there was nowhere near, he, there was again nowhere near where he said he was. So uh, then coming further south from when he was obviously further north, uh, he was walking about 20 miles each day and uh, you could sort of track where he must have been. So I had three fixes that all said the same point. So I put a dot on the map and uh, drew a, a two and a half k circle around it and um, 
rang up my brother. I said, you know, you're doing anything for a while? And he's thinking, no, no. So I said, well, you know, you, you are now. And, uh, so we went to this dot on the map. And so we set up there and um, drove out to this spot in the in the middle of the Simpson Desert. And uh, it, it was a long way out, I promise you. And you think, you know, uh, where do you start? So uh, I had my quad bike with me. and. Um, uh, we started going up and down the, the you know the edges of the sand hills, and we had to make some interpretation of um, you know where would you be if you're driving along on your camel. And he had many references in his book that you couldn't cross the sand hills; they were just too too big. And I mean, the reason he dumped the gear, in his words, were you know they were in a perilous situation; they were, had you know next to no water left. They knew how far they had to go. And they made this decision, uh, and they were travelling at night for the temperature reasons. Uh, they were pulling up around one or two o'clock in the morning, and, and leaving the, the following day around seven or eight at night. And he's recording temperatures of 118, 114. So, you yeah, know, all the the, the yeah, high temperature just didn't come yesterday. With the ABC telling us it's getting hot, but it was hot back then. I promise you. And we're talking 1904. Um, so they unloaded their camels, and um, in reference of where we went there, like we thought, I said, my brother, well, you wouldn't drive along, you know, walk along between sand hills, and the sand hills are arguably two, three hundred metres apart. You'd walk along the edge of one to when you see a little slot, you could slide up. So that, we ran that theory for uh, three or four days, and on the, we weren't uh, finding any gear, we, we found a couple of skulls of camels and a couple of dingoes and uh, dead ones and uh, so we're finding little bits and pieces but nothing to do with Barclay and my brother said oh well, how long are we going to stay here? I said well we said seven days and I said it's only four and a half you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously the older brother so you can say that you know. So we, and I might add when we were there it was uh, very hot too, it was over 35, 30, uh, 38. And there was a fly plane. It was a massive fly plane. You just couldn't walk around without a, uh, you know, a fly canopy on with something I've never ever used in my life before. Uh, I thought that was only sort of, you know, pretenders, you know. But um, there was flies there, and so I said, "No, look, let's go out. Let's go a little bit past our two and a half k out. Well, let's go over there because I said I, I had many prints of his." Um, of, of the diary out, and I'm reading again, and I said, I don't reckon he crossed too many sandals at all. So we'll go over, one more over there, and then we'll go up and down there, uh, on the edge of the sand hill. And there it was, we suddenly saw these uh, 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 four water cans. They were sticking out of the grass, just like that. The grass was about that high, so they weren't sticking out much. And uh, you know, I jumped off the bike and ran over, and um, I uh, said, Quincy, this is, this is what we found. And I tell you, it still gives me a bit of a feeling that, uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone, uh, uh, yeah, we all want to find things when you travel out in the desert, but uh, to suddenly find that, and it was for real, and, and it was where we thought it would be, it, it was a tremendously satisfying thing. And uh, I've said in previous uh, interviews with that, you know, uh, people talk about the Bathurst and car racing, that, and I say, well, anyone can do that. <laughs> Very true feeling that uh, you know, uh, especially we're over 106 kilometres from where he said he left the gear. So, um, and we never went to his spot, I might add. And uh, but on reflection, um, I think he made a, in my view, made a deliberate error of one degrees. Uh, it all stacked up to one degree, and uh, McPherson, who was the author of the diary, uh, Barclay himself didn't write a diary. It was the Barclay and McPherson diary written by Barclay, uh, pardon me, written by McPherson, and uh, he, he financed it all and they left a lot of gear there and, and I think he thought, hang on, this is, I'll come back one day and pick this up, we're talking, would have been back then many thousands of dollars and uh, so he, he had to write something down that he wouldn't forget and he, instead of writing 135 degrees, uh, 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 53 minutes, he wrote 136 degrees, which on his instruments is only four minutes difference, but that's a huge error if you're trying to do longitude. So the, there's then now four things stacked up, you know, to the, the three I mentioned before, plus take off one degree, and that's where it should be. And um, 
Yeah, so uh, upon, upon finding the gear, um, I had a little bit presumptuous. I'd only taken that one little box up with me, you know, to store stuff in. And after, you know, we tried to take enough photos to get a good idea of what's going on, and we scratched around, and immediately we, we, we just, you know, found massive amounts of gear. And we found that in a manner that suggested that it wasn't, had never, ever been disturbed at all by anybody. And uh, that was also interesting because I had a long chat with Dick Kimber about uh, uh, Actorangium. I had found it, I didn't tell him about it. Uh, I said, Where, what do you reckon would have happened to a gear? He said, well, in his humble opinion, he said the Aboriginals would have found it for sure. And um, if they didn't, so much mining goes on, people are wandering around all the time, someone else would have found it. So, and not not to try to remotely put anything against Dick Kim, but he was he was off the mark, and uh, I say this with the utmost respect, uh, because the gear was there and, and untouched, and uh, it was a little bit scattered in the uh, range. Of, we searched a 20 meter by 20 meter area, and um, some of it was a bit pulled apart. Uh, there, were, there were wooden boxes that they left according to the list. There was a list. The wood had completely disintegrated, the mass had fell apart. Yeah, you know, they had over a thousand rounds of ammunition. That was in boxes and that fell apart. They had uh, a side of bacon there. Can you imagine a couple of hungry, hungry dingoes got over the side of bacon and so there was rolls of leather and there was there was like literally thousands of items there. Big rolls of leather, little rolls of leather, there was carpenters' tools. I mean I bought a a, a, a Plane there, and they had a spoke shave, a big spoke shave, little spoke shaves, bracing bits, and uh, the bits range from uh, three sixteenths up to an inch and a quarter. We found all of those. Um, we found the pho photographic gear. There's one single glass plate there that I brought. We found about sixty intact ones. We, we can't determine. Or we don't believe this image on them, but. The uh, experts in Adelaide here have said, told me, don't touch them, don't wash them, don't do nothing to them, give them to us because there may be something, and we've yet to give them to the Adelaide people to have a look at. Um, but in the process of digging up stuff, and uh, I'm thinking, I don't know what we're going to do with this, it's just too much stuff here, you know. So we decided uh, to, we've been there now six days, we decided to stack it, as in cover it, I should say, and covered it right up because when you're out there and you're going to leave it, you think, God, someone might come along and find it. Like 115 years, no one found it. You get paranoid about it, yeah. So we headed off, left it bit behind, covered it up, covered it up with old trees and stuff. And we, we'd done about 50 miles uh, across the desert again. And we came across, we came across a bloody um, a, a camel, our tourist camel trainers, <laughs> 17 camels and. Uh, they, they got the shock of their life as we got the shock of our life to come over hill and, and luckily they weren't heading in our, in our direction but we were a bit worried, well I was certainly worried that you know after all these years and we would exposed a lot of gear, we didn't want to be found by someone. So when I got back to uh, uh, Melbourne um, I uh, rang up uh, various parties, uh, I rang up quite a few people in the Adelaide uh, in I'll use the word the heritage side of the government, and they were totally disinterested. And uh, I, I, told, I hadn't told them I'd found anything. I, thought, I just said, I, I think I might find it. And, um, and then um, further chatting, um, I ended up going to the Northern Territory guy. I rang them up because it was in their territory. It was in Northern Territory, not South Australia. And um, I, I, someone answered the phone, and uh, I said, look, I really want to talk to the you know, the boss, you know, who's the boss? And he said, well, actually, I'm the boss. I picked the phone up because no one else will pick it up. <laughs> and, and he was a tremendously good guy. He was so, so pleased to take the phone call. And he helped me at every step. Because I said, look, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to find this stuff, you know, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, a, a pretty normal thing, he said, where private citizens don't want to be fleeced by the big government arm, and I was certainly in that uh, league. I, I, and he gave me great confidence that it would be well looked after if they, you know, if we uh, played them into the game. And he wanted to send a helicopter down with two archaeologists straight away. 
I said, well, it's 600 k's out from Darwin, you're from, uh, pardon me, out from Alice Springs, you want a pretty good alley up there, you know, um, <laughs> you know, to get there and back. So I said, no, don't worry about that. So a couple of weeks later, he sent down two um, archaeologists uh, to meet us, and uh, one was a resident um, 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 Alice Springs guy, and another one was a woman from uh, Darwin, and uh, they're on the phone, this is weeks leading up, so where will I meet you? I said, I'll meet you at Loafers Dam. Where's that? I said, if you can't find that, don't even come. He goes, are we in the, no, you've got to be able to sort all this out. So no more phone calls, and a couple of weeks later, I've gone to Loafers Dam, and I'm an hour late, and uh, I see a vehicle heading off over the sand hills, and I'm on my quad bike, because I'm about an hour and a half from the site, I said, where are you going? So he said, well, who are you? I said, well, let's work it out, blah, blah. I said, where? You can't just head off here. <laughs> anyway, they were keen. I saw straight away they were keen. They wanted to get on with it. So they stayed with us for um, uh, that first uh, trip uh, for about seven days, eight days. And then I was also joined with my mate Blakey, wherever he's gone. And, um, and so we dug again for seven days and found twice as much stuff. We still found too much stuff to take home. We, we took, sorry, we took it home, but we had so much stuff left. And a further two weeks later, we went back to the site to, uh, for another seven days for the same two archaeologists. And they were a tremendous help. They um, uh, you know, um, identified every, every part as we pulled it out, uh, catalogued it, uh, wrote the precise location down, and, and just generally helped, a tremendous help. Because uh, in the process of finding stuff, um, it, it was covered in sand, but not by uh, digging a hole, it was drifting sand that had covered it. And uh, we could see that by, by undrifting it. And uh, the second and third trip I made a mechanical sieve, which I took up, because we were shoveling dirt, and uh, we shoveled over 80 tonnes of dirt by hand over the time. Um, we're talking 20 metres by 20 metres, 18 inches deep, and we had to put it all through the sieve. Um, we'd identify with the metal detector where there could be something. But we found, uh, we, I haven't worked it out precisely, but there was uh, 200 red shotgun uh, rounds of number six and uh, uh, number four and VBs for I don't know, we didn't know about those, but I, th I reckon we got every piece of shot. We got nearly 10 kilos of shot, which we found. That's how fine we were sifting. We found things like, uh, this is not a quiz, but do any of you guys know what a Dacron is? We all say, ah, it's a great bit of money, yeah. Anyway, we found the Dacron. What the hell is a Dacron? Um, anyway, Dacron is, a, is a, a measure of weight, mostly used in the medical world in the late 1800s over in England. And then we found these things called scruples, which were much smaller. What the hell is a scruple? Huh? Now, a scruple is a, I think it's five scruples to a Dacron and so on. So we found all these very small uh, uh, weights. We found uh, the uh, uh, two grain, three grain, four grain, and five grain stamped weight, which yeah, we're talking unbelievably small. And we found the uh, beam balance uh, that they carried, a little beam balance yeah, for weighing obviously gold. Uh, you see there the pest on water. Uh, we wondered why you carry that, but again, that's just the battery for the any quartz they found to identify gold. Bottom line is most of the things they were carrying, they were looking for gold. They, they for sure told the government, we'll go up and see if there's any pastoral land, whether there's a track through Queensland, we'll, yeah, check it out. But they were looking for gold. And I might add, they said officially, we also keep an eye out for our white car, because he's up here somewhere. So, um, yeah, but they were gold prospecting, and um, most of the equipment was directly related to gold. They had three miners' picks, they had three uh, you know, washing uh, trays, uh, no water, but they had the trays. Um, you know, the magnifying glass there, and as time goes on, any of you, don't forget, if you want to go and have a look at a very small sample of stuff there, uh, it is there. But the, the, um, the, the handy thing was he left a list of what he left behind in that diary, and it's in there now, and it was a it was a full list, but, but in some, one sense not complete because he said we left two large wooden boxes. I don't know what was in the wooden boxes. So, you know, some of the stuff we found is not 
obviously listen to them it was in these boxes, but there was a, a, an enormous amount of things. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's, it's a 15 kilogram, uh, my estimate, uh, yeah, the old Wicked Witch's Cauldron, you know, it was huge, you know. Uh, and I just think the poor old camel when he's, they saw him coming in the morning, I wonder what that was, you know. <laughs> there was a six metre cable, a steel cable, a, a three quarter of an inch in diameter, you know, with a woe of an eye each end. And we will never know why they carried that. I had, there was no attachments other than leather, which, which we don't have. Um, so there were certain things we didn't know what was all about, but what was the most staggering to us was the amount of ammunition they carried. It was a tremendous amount of ammunition. And, um, um, and, and whether they, they said they left all their ammunition, they took their rifles back. So I don't know if they took them back empty or just had a, some more ammunition. But this is a, a, a little bit of a quiet side of, the, of any of the explorers. We don't know a lot of this detail of why they were carrying things, because especially you know, the ammunition, the 303 stuff, was, that was the, uh, you know, the most modern uh, military uh, rifle of all time way back then, and they had 300 rounds of ammunition, so they were going to do some serious shooting. <laughs> um, captain Barclay was indeed a naval captain and ran his own gunboat uh, with 32 guns on it in the 1860s. Uh, uh, he went down to the Falklands and had a couple of shots of those Argentinians and that, but he, he got around and uh, he, he went to Tasmania and he started a big uh, uh, property there, he got sick of that after four years, <coughs> went to New Zealand and surveyed the railways and so on, uh, forgot he was married and got married again, and <laughs> went, went back to uh, England twice, the, 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 the guy was a goer, he, was a <laughs> but he said he, he, his, his family, he, he had a couple of kids and that, they all travelled first class according to other writings that I've read, with, you know, the, the factual writings. But the amount of work he did uh, is just fantastic and um, he eventually died in uh, Melbourne in uh, 1917 and uh, the Navy buried him at sea for some reason. Like he was, he was well regarded, even though at one stage he was uh, slapped on the wrist for using his title captain when he wasn't allowed to. Um, so he was a bit mischievous, but, but he still did things, you know, he, he got off his butt and got, got out there. And th this is one of the problems. He was rel relatively successful. Like if he hadn't died up there, it would, would have this been quite uh, more valuable in one sense. But he didn't. He, he got all these guys home, and uh, yeah, that that was a big task back there. Like a lot of the guys, as we read about, didn't get home. Yeah. Right. Having found the spot, have you done anything to mark it? Because I presume otherwise the sand will just take over again. Oh, here we have. <laughs> yeah. I'm very optimistic in life, and I went up there with my plates already made up. <laughs> <laughs> I always carry in my truck, and I've got photos of my truck, but I always carry stainless steel plates, uh, four mil thick, number punches, uh, stainless steel wire, and uh, um, galvanised iron droppers, uh, uh, star pickets, droppers. And uh, in the site, there's a, a one point, a two point three metre star picket galvanised, driven in uh, down to about that height. And the uh, clerk is written on it, saying, you know, all the appropriate things. And um, <laughs> you uh, you? what I haven't done is put the clerk into the spot where he said he left it. And I've said, if not here, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got? Well. That is Mr. McPherson, the man with the money. Uh, you notice that he wanted to, on his, uh, this is from Barclay to the government, he wanted to call Kingsland up there, funny enough. I'm probably glad that didn't get up. Uh, this is, that's an early map that he had, it's just the indicator if that's out from the McDonald Ranges. Um, that somebody's typed up objectives that he put to the government, you know, with, and uh, just zooming in on it, uh, he's written to the minister, you yeah, the crown lands as you can see, uh, and obviously looking for a few bucks, and that's where he got his six camels there as you can see, and they'd returned in good condition, we brought back eight, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> really quite, uh, we wanted to examine and map the area, which is uh, unmapped and so on, we've, we've gone over that. Uh, um, 
and, and more of what they were going to do up there. Um, we got, uh, look for a stock group from that Ancora war I mentioned earlier, just up from Dalhousie, <coughs> that's in Northern Territory, that was a war put down in 1902 that gushed out uh, 600,000 litres of gallons a day and ran for 90 years before someone in the government decided to switch it off, which that's why you can see it from Google Earth, it's, a, it's left a strip of land, uh, uh, watery land for about two and a half kilometres long. Um, uh, they, they said they'd find some, see if they'd find some traces of, of, of Mrs. Leica. Uh, so that was uh, another reason. Uh, oh yeah, that's on day one out in, in the library, and I, I promise you, I was that excited to find, get that diary in my hand, Margaret, thank you again. <laughs> but to flick through and find the relevant pages was, was pretty uh, exciting. And uh, yeah, a lot of credit's got to go to the, the society and, of course, the people that, that have kept all this stuff alive. Because we're talking under uh, 15 years old now, that. Um, this was a map that he, earlier was mentioned, the 1904-1906 expedition. It was the 1904 expedition, and he got back in, in late December of 1904. He did another expedition in 1906, and this was a map. Uh, he, he, he didn't put a report in for a year and a half, so this was the map. Uh, this was his indeed group. We've got the border here, birds all over here. Uh, that's where he left the gear. Oh, hang on, I think uh, I'll go here. That was the recorded drop right there. And I, they're my uh, drawings. That was the actual drop. It's 106 k's away. And that just gives you some uh, idea of uh, that's the latitude and longitude. So any of the needle line, just take one degree off that and you'll be pretty close. Pretty close. So um, that was the uh, government property that uh, they left behind. The list was in the diary. Uh, an enormous list, uh, as you can see, uh, these buckets, shovels, picks, crowbars, uh, ropes, tent pegs. It was just an enormous amount of stuff. The half a side of bacon. That's a great, that is, I think the site is about here somewhere, um, and that's, that's a quite a good photo. I, I think Pete took that with his uh, stand on very tall ladder. <laughs> <laughs> and this is um, this is Barclay here, and this is uh, McPherson down here. I don't know who this guy is. Um, we just don't have a lot of information on the extras, but that was a typical camp. Um, is one of the Toyotas. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, well, these photos I find fantastic. Uh, yeah, that they get, oh, yeah. make such a good photo. But look inside that box. Imagine if you're the camel saying, oh, well, that box. <laughs> huge, huge, huge box. And uh, uh, just, just more of their, their train. Uh, that's my brother and I uh, out there. That's a, a uh, you know, a soda bottle, and some of you drinkers would know what it is, come on. <laughs> that was intact, that wasn't buried funny enough, it was only half buried, and the, and the hand, the top part is all intact. There had been fire go through it, we found a lot of the gear had been melted, uh, which clearly, uh, you know, bushfires over the time. Now that was after day one, and this is the big pot I'm drawing out, it's the mama pot, that one, that was big. Um, but we found three times that amount of gear. Um, it was just, just kept coming and coming. Uh, that, that's my truck that I, I travel with, it's a seven ton, uh, fully loaded, it's a, a Mercedes uh, Unimog. Um, that's Sandy. Uh, that's, uh, Brother and I pretending we're looking at things. <laughs> now that's untouched how that's totally as, as they were. Uh, the, the fourth um, thing is out of frame, but they were just sitting there, just like that. Yeah. And they were the same, same three again, untouched there. Uh, we were searching with our metal detector to work out where to dig and then what to do with the diggings and uh, 
Yeah, that went on and on and on. That, that is something long we found there. We're still unsure about it. We think it was a roll of leather about five foot long. That it's, it's decomposed so badly now, it's, it's difficult to tell what it was. Um, there's more stuff that was found, glass plates we were finding all the time. There's another glass plate that's in the pillow recently. Um, that's uh, a, a 200 pound um, scale, uh, uh, spring scale. The, the, you can see the letters around there, the weights, the, you know, the hook, hook down there. Um, that was, they had a 200 pound scale, that one. Uh, they had a 25 pound probably uh, sulfur scale and then the green bar. That's a selection of the uh, bottles we found. Um, that's the little green balance I was talking about. That's a centimetre, so that's what, two and a half inches. Uh, that still had the cat gut uh, on the, that it was hung by, I assume cat gut, because they didn't have nylon back there. And that's two, two uh, plates for big stuff, and that's for little stuff. Um, they're little silver chains. Uh, we don't know what they are, so there are eight of those. They're, they're, again, that's a centimetre across there, so you can, it's about 25 mil long, inch long. And that point is a, is a loose point, so if anyone can shed light on that, we'd be wrapped. Um, that's the bag of ray bullets. Um, again, we don't know that that was fitted on something for optical purposes. Uh, that's over on the table there. And, and, and I would, invite everyone to have a look at you that one. That's the little locket I spoke about. Um, number 835, non-transferable, 1902. So if you've got any records, we've been on to the um, um, South Australian Cricket Club and they can't find their records. They collect they were um, burnt, as in fire. So if anyone's got any uh, light on that, would be great. That is after I have um, cleaned the sand out. It took me a couple of hours to get it to freely work. It was absolutely packed full of the finest sand going, even though it was beautifully shut. How the sand got in it, I'll never know. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's pulled out of the ground other than shook the sand out. That's the mechanical set we made, and uh, that's my normal pose there. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else doing the work. It's a supervisor pose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, supervisor pose. <laughs> but um, the super was a great thing because we could get a bit of noise because the metal detectors of today are so fantastic. You can put a, a single piece of um, lead shot from a, a shotgun, you know, BB, down two foot and it'll find it. Uh, but it's quicker to sieve it because uh, you then find a lot of things you don't you don't hear. Uh, that's the um, stainless steel site that I mentioned earlier uh, in there. So that should be there hopefully in 100 years. And that's the sand hill behind us that they walked up in the morning at 7 o'clock, according to his diary, and could see nothing but sand hills as far as I could see. And they decided to dump their gear. Is that it? Can you please thank